OK, I think we're already set to begin. Um, so if more people join, I'll continue to let people in from the waiting room. Um, but otherwise, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you, Bettina. Um, OK, so first of all, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Sorger here to talk. Um, I have greatly enjoyed reading your papers, Bettina, and um, I'm really excited to hear um, you know, what you have to say and also uh, experience your demo. Um, so Dr. Sorger studied psychology at Cologne University in Germany, and after obtaining her diploma in 2002, she developed cl clinical applications for functional MRI at the University Hospital of Cologne. Uh, from 2005 to 2009, she worked on her PhD project developing brain-computer interfaces based on real-time fMRI at Maastricht University. After obtaining her doctorate in 2010, she joined the Coma Science Group at the University of Liège in Be Belgium as a postdoctoral fellow where she applied fMRI-based communications, um, BCIs, in non-responsive coma, coma patients. Since her return to Maastricht University, Dr. Sorger uh, currently works as an associate professor in cognitive neuroscience at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Uh, she has done research in several fields of fundamental and clinical and applied neuroscience with a focus on extending fMRI-based communication, BCIs, to various sensory uh, modalities, such as tactile, um, and transferring these mo methods to mobile functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which is why we're here today, um, so for FNIRS. Um, another strong focus of her current research is the implementation of hemodynamic brain signals for neurofeedback, such as therapy. Um, over the last year, she's considerably contributed to develop and advance the field of fMRI and FNIRS-based neurofeedback. She's successfully applied fMRI neurofeedback to various clinical and non-clinical populations, contributed to developments of novel real-time data analysis procedures, and provided theoretical and practical insights into fMRI and FNIRS-based biofeedback. So without much further ado, uh, Bettina, the floor is yours, and thank you again for giving this presentation. Thank you, Dina, also for organizing this meeting. I'm very happy to, to present um, to, to you today. And it's not so much to show what, what I've been doing, or it's, it's also hopefully to further motivate people to use FNIRS if they don't do yet. Um, because I really think that FNIRS is much better than its current reputation. Um, yes, so my topic is brain-computer interfacing. Um, and I started with fMRI, as um, Dinah said, um, but I switched now to FNIRS for several reasons, and I think this will become clear in my talk. Um, so what is brain-computer interfacing? Brain-computer interfacing is, um, is a methodology um, which um, makes something possible, which is not possible normally, namely to connect directly a brain with an external device, for example, a computer. And, and why do we do this? This is um, to allow, for example, to interact with the outside world just based on brain signals. And what is crucial, what is the big point here is that we need, um, in comparison to normal functional brain imaging, we need to immediately use the brain activation during the ongoing data acquisition. And this is really quite challenging because it requires real-time online analysis, which is, of course, um, yeah, connected to several problems yeah. and several um, important points. OK, so this is the general setup of any given BCI system. We have a brain, and this is measured with any functional brain imaging methods, and this signal which is dignitized, will be then uh, join a signal processing unit. And here, a, a feature, an informative feature of the brain signal is extracted. And there was also a translation algorithm, for example, to, to pre-read on, for example, for, for a specific frequency in the EG band or something is a yes, or another one is a no, and so on. And then we have the um, yeah, um, application of the um, BCI system. That means um, from the signal processing unit comes a command and it goes to a device which can be a letter speller, a wheelchair, a robot, um, whatever. So why do we do BCIs? I already said, yeah, we do it for, for motor independent um, interaction, but not only. We can only use neurofeedback 
um, for, or we, we, you can use PCI for neurofeedback, for neurofeedback learning and therapy. So that means uh, we can either enhance normal brain function or we can um, use it for neurotherapy. And, and what is the reason for this? So the brain is the origin of any mental and physical human functioning. And that means that any function is associated with activation in brain structures that are dedicated for this particular function. And um, we know that brain activation is altered in disease. This brings along the theoretical possibility to influence human functioning by changing brain activation. Um, normally, neural activation is inaccessible to us. So here, neurofeedback comes into the play, namely enabling you to first monitor and then also modulate the brain activation. And this is then in it into a desired direction. So for example, we know how a healthy brain looks or the function is and, and so on. Um, yeah, the other um, path is the interaction BCI. So here we willfully modulate brain activation in order to, to kind of control an external device, or we can use it for communication. And, and why is this necessary or of any sense? So human interaction normally um, requires the functional integrity of our neuromuscular system. And there are several motor impairments that result in the inability to naturally interact while being fully conscious and awake. And this is, of course, a ethically very um, difficult situation. So there's a high importance to provide such patients with motor independence, uh, motor independent alternatives. And, and BCIs can replace lost motor functions by using the voluntarily evoked brain activation. And application fields are, for example, um, locked in syndrome or disorders of consciousness patients. I'm currently focused on cerebral palsy, but there might, many, might be many more um, applications. So I said in the overview, um, BCIs can have several input modalities, several functional neuroimaging methods can serve for this. So the most important one, I have to agree, that I have to admit that EG, EG works very well, has, has been developed for, I think, almost four, five decades now um, with respect to um, BCIs. And it's the, the, the choice of an EG, but there, uh, of a BCI, but there are also situations in which they do not work. We call this EG literacy. So then other techniques might work better. In, anyway, um, there, it's always important to have a, a bunch of methods and uh, then we increase the chance that patients can benefit, all patients or most patients can benefit. So therefore also hemodynamic BCAIs um, were developed in recent years and starting of course with fMRI having the higher resolution, temporary resolution, uh, uh, higher spatial resolution and so on. Um, but yeah, um, then FMIRS and I think for good reasons. So when we look at BCI relevant characteristics of the hemodynamic response, we first have a negative and that's the delay, the hemodynamic delay. So when we look at the short stimulus like this one here, a, a flicker board stimulus, the electric response is immediate and short. But what about the hemodynamic response? So I have here plotted this in real time, let's say. It takes up to three seconds um, until the signal increases, and it takes actually 10 seconds um, to baseline, to come back to baseline. This, of course, is a, is a drawback and limits the efficiency of BCIs. But what is good? Good is, for example, the high single trial reliability that hemodynamic signals can have. Here you see fMRI data from the um, dorsal premotor uh, in the motor um, task um, um, experiment. And you see here the red phases. This is the motor task period of 10 seconds and resting periods of 20 seconds. And you really see nicely on every single trial a clear response. That's, that's really amazing. I mean, this we don't have with EEG. Here we have to normally average across uh, many trials in order to see um, the response, but here you have it immediately. Here you even see, this is three Tesla data, uh, the initial dip a little bit. Okay, so that's good. What is also good is the spatial resolution. Um, fMRI, of course, is, is much better than EEG, and um, a little bit better is FNIRS. Um, against EEG, I would say. And here you see, for example, um, what we can um, see when we um, look at fMRI data. Um, 
um, activation patterns evoked by different mental tasks, for example, motor imagery, you see a specific network activated, um, then disappears during resting with the delay, then mental calculation, you see popping up another network, partially there might be overlapping areas, and for the third uh, task, which is in a speech, we see uh, another network. When we put these three on top of each other, we see we have distinct areas, but we also have overlapping areas, and this needs to be entangled when we use this for different um, information encoding. Yeah, encoding. How can we encode in information? Of course, it would be so great if we could just read our thoughts. Um, and many people have tried this. Many people are still trying this. And many people will try doing this. But it's hard. And it's always connected so far to, um, uh, to time. So we need a lot of time for training uh, classifiers before and so on. So for now, the direct encoding approach um, is not working so well. It's not working reliably, especially not um, on the short term and so on. So direct would mean we think yes and we think no. And we see different patterns. We can decode this on a single trial level. That's not possible. So therefore, we go for the indirect encoding, which means um, we, we use the knowledge from basic neuroscience, for example, that motor imagery evokes another pattern in mental imagery and mental talking. And this we can differentiate on a single trial level, and therefore we can encode two different answers here. So the exploitable hemodynamic signal features are the spatial temp. Uh, yeah, spatial, what we just uh, already discussed, then temporal, because I might um, vary, for example, the start of the encoding time window. So I could say, OK, for answer yes, there's another uh, delay in starting then for answer B and so on. And what I also tried, but without success, uh, was the magnitudinal approach to, to try to increase um, the, the brain signal to different levels. I did it with fMRI. It, it is working when you average across many trials, but we need something on a single trial level, and this didn't work, honestly. Um, so how can we encode an information? This is always by intentionally generated mental activities. And this can be higher order cognitive tasks like mental calculation, language related tasks like inner speech, mental singing, then mental imagery, visual, um, motor, auditory, tactile or emotion imagery. Some work better, some work uh, worse. And or we can also do some um, selective election, selective attention tasks. So, for example, um, visual, auditory or tactile um, attention. This has all been um, already explored quite well, and so we know what works best. Um, so the whole motivation for myself, also for the for my PhD work, was one of the studies, a really pioneering work from Owen et al, or also later Monty et al, that used spatial fMRI signal features to, um, first of all, to uh, detect awareness in a patient that was actually diagnosed as being in a vegetative state, namely by asking the patient to play tennis or Sp uh, navigate spatially to the house, of course, everything to, to, to imagine. And they saw really activation patterns that were distinct and that were really similar to healthy control groups. So the only logical conclusion that could be drawn, this person is conscious. So by that, the person got an upgrade in, 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 the, in the diagnosis and later also awaked also behaviorally from, from the vegetative state. Yeah, and then this um, yes no paradigm was further developed by by Monty also to show this in patients that it worked in one patient. So our group and during my PhD, I then have developed a multiple choice BCI that combined both spatial and temporal fMRI signal features. And this worked very well. This was also applied later in a patient um, in a locked in patient. So we really saw okay, that works also with um, patients. And finally, also in my PhD, I developed a letter speller that also combines spatial and temporal fMRI signal features. Um, and by that, we, we could really communicate um, short phrases um, yeah, in the first session, in the first fMRI session with a very good accuracy. Uh, here is shortly mentioned um, also a motivation for me that one cl a classical block in syndrome patient could also use the fMRI um, here, the multiple choice encoding technique to communicate answers. Um, and it was the lesion was here in the pons very classically. But what was really clear from this measurement, I have to say, that this will 
of course not be something which can be applied um, on a frequent basis and so on. But it was good that we saw that patients can use um, hemodynamic brain signals. So when we look at the requirements for a clinical BCI, then we think, okay, what do we need? We need next to high functionality and full safety that it works um, for a long time. So it's really something that is, uh, the equipment is stable and, and that we can really do it for a long period. Then the individualization is also very important. Um, something that I also realized is comfortability. Um, I mean, when we put on the cap for the measurements, that's that's fine for one hour, but I mean, these patients should try, uh, yeah, be able or it should be reasonable to, to have it on the whole day. So it should be really comfortable. It should be user friendly and um, also operator friendly. If necessary, there's operator should be also easy uh, for, for the operator, especially if it's maybe a caregiver of a patient, a family member and so on, because we don't want always a neuroscientist next to, to the patient. Then affordability, of course, FNEOS, for example, is more affordable than FMRI. I mean, still improvement possible. Aesthetics is also a, a very important um, um, point because we know that the acceptance, um, yeah, how it looks, the aesthetics is very important for the compliance um, of patients. And then something which is really not um, possible with fMRI was the usability in daily life. So it should work independent from place of time, should be compatible with other medical equipment, should be mobile, compact, robust, should have a low sensitivity to motion and should be little prone to failure. And I think um, a lot of this can be um, realized by using F years. Um, but what, what I would like to summarize all is we need naturalistic patient-centered approaches and a focus on the usability in everyday world for these clinical BCIs. So when we speak about um, everyday world and um, in the beginning, actually, when I started with um, FNIRS, I put my subject in the darkest room I could imagine. Um, it was really uh, boring and depressive, I would say. What I realized is that when we go with our equipment in the real world, generally the alertness is higher, the attention is higher, the motivation is higher. People feel less socially, physically isolated. And also what, what is a pro is that uh, people can be quite close um, to the, the, the person, um, to the subject. Of course, initially I thought these are all disturbing variables in our experiments, but I think at least they, they are compensated um, by this higher alertness and attention. And I say this, I want to stress that, that maybe also police people, they do not need to go in the field. Maybe they should go in the field uh, with the FNIRS uh, machine because it might have actually um, more advantages than the drawbacks to really um, measure outside the lab. But for the study, it has also um, many um, advantages. We have less confounding effects um, to, through the lab situation, yeah, because also the lab is an artificial situation. Then we have uh, a higher external and ecologic validity of the results. Then we have more um, interaction set. This is also kind of a collaborative situation between the subject and the experimenter, which is really nice. Um, then we can expand our behavioral repertoire that we can study, for example, the motor system much better. And we can um, also use combine neuroscience methods easier. And actually, last but not least, also for the experimenter, it has some advantages. It saves, it saves cost for some lab fees in my case. And um, also, um, yeah, the logistics is, is easier because you don't need to book a lab and so on. This is some data that I checked just for fun. Um, there's a recent uh, bachelor's uh, study that was with a study that was performed in the dark lab and um, a bachelor thesis also uh, some time ago um, that was in the everyday world. And you see that um, it was approximately the same length of the experiment, that the mean, um, what is it here, the, the alertness, concentration and comfortability kept um, more constant in the everyday world uh, situation. So again, I mean, just for, for uh, a te as a teaser. So what are the advantages of Avenir's specifically for the BCI? 
situation. So first of all, we have both. We have oxy and deoxygenated hemoglobin changes that we measure, measure and this increases the robustness and certainty our, of our decodings, for example. Then, as said, the non-invasiveness, the full safety. Then that it's nearly noiseless. It's also an advantage. We have compact equipment and uh, we can measure uh, an individual in any body posture or position. Um, it's relatively, now I wouldn't say cheap, but it's less expensive than other techniques. It's invulnerable to a neuroelectric um, electromagnetic environment and compatible with paramagnetic um, techniques. We have the high single reliability, reliability which is really important for, um, for, for BCI. Um, in general, I and that you will also see later, um, the technique is quite easy also to, to start with. To, to, you know, I always say it's a, it's a perfect technique for students because um, actually there's no danger. I mean, they can, of course, it can break, but normally there's no danger like with fMRI scanning and, and, and things like this that, that, that you have safety issues and so on. Um, it's relatively easy to, 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 um, to do. Um, it is relatively low sensitive to head motion artifacts. And last but not least, it's portable and mobile, which comes along with the environmental flexibility. So the last four points I would actually like to present or demonstrate in a um, live demo later here at home, at my home. So they see it's not a lab or something. Um, so what are the 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 the, the, the cons? We we still have some cons. We have to be aware of that we indirectly measure brain activity. So this is especially for the neurofeedback, a drawback. Then um, we have a, a spatial variability of brain anatomy and function, but at the same time, we lack individual anatomical information. I mean, it's comparable to EEG that also works to some degree, but, but yeah, it's not as with fMRI, for example. Then we have a high variability of ethnic signal quality. I think this is what all FNIS, um users have already experienced. Um, this mostly is related to physical features of participants. I discuss shortly this later. Then we have a high susceptibility to non-task or task evoke systemic extra cerebral and cerebral activity. And this needs to be corrected in real time, which is quite challenging, but we can do, for example, by short channel regression. We have a limited temporal resolution. I mean, it's better than, um, it's a little bit better maybe than um, fMRI, but it's we are still um, yeah, bound to the, the biological constraint of the hemodynamic response. We have limited spatial resolution and coverage um, and the depth pervasion. So here you see the FNIS coverage mass, which is of course an approximation, but this is maybe the depth that you can reach with getting good signal. And um, you also don't really reach all um, parts um, um, of the, the cortex, for example, the ventral part. Then I have to say the, the I experienced it like this, that the FNS equipment is still limited and the flexibility is low. Um, so for example, when it comes to optic montage, it, it takes time and it's really, um, yeah, could, could be better. And we still have, I call, yeah, these blind spots, which um, means that you measure always between the source and the uh, source and the detector, but not between the two detectors or two sources. I mean, there are solutions to this for like um, high density of NIRS or uh, um, this newer um, developments, but this of course costs a lot of money. And until everyone has it, we have somehow to, to still overcome this a little bit. I have some ideas for that. I'll show you in a second. So in order to, to um, yeah, make it a little bit more vivid. I have some uh, example studies selected that, that show that how we address these different challenges that I just um, um, named. So for example, one study um, investigated um, the neural correlates of eight different mental imagery tasks in also to see what degree of freedom can we reach um, when using um, spatial ethnias um, signal features for BCI. Um, we also wanted to investigate the separability of these um, brain activation patterns on a single trial level, what is important for PCI. And also we wanted to see what about individual mental imagery tasks? Do they work better maybe than those that we um, instruct the participants? So this is a 
actually one of the biggest uh, setups that I have ever used. Um, it's a system, 16 sources, 24 detectors. Um, it was still in, uh, recorded in times where we don't have these spring-loaded optodes yet, so it was quite a lot of work. And you see that the cortex that we could cover it was mostly, yeah, was, I would say, maybe two-thirds, maybe, yeah. Um, so the total the left hemisphere and parts of the right hemisphere. We had eight different mental tasks that are listed here, all partially mentioned already. And we also had subjects ask, what, what is your favorite task that you could imagine? So mostly this was related to hobby um, activities, like uh, one person here, karate movement imagery, or um, mental motor cycling, knitting, and so on. And uh, yeah, there was also one, one run also that included this task to um, elaborate. So we, we varied a bit the length of the task. And um, yeah, it was an experiment of about one hour. So what uh, was the outcome? So this is actually data here of fMRI, because these subjects also under underwent uh, fMRI scanning in order to be able to compare. And I have to say, this is an individual activation maps from one participant which is a good participant. If I say good, means it's it's nicely suited for FNIRS. It seems to have features, physical features that are promising for FNIRS use. And, and you really see nicely, first of all, a strong coherence between H, uh, HBO and HBR uh, for the patterns. And you also see nicely that um, the spatial resolution is a little bit worse because we have bigger blobs and so on. But you see nice um, coherence with um, uh, with fMRI data here, for example, you see um, this is very, very striking. So we have also in the FNIR signal enough, um, I mean, seeing this is GLM results, uh, we have enough data to, to, to disentangle them on a multi-trial level. But then, of course, the question is, what about on the single trial level? First of all, I want to zoom in in this data. This is, this is um, the data projected on a standard brain, and here's the data projected onto the brain of this participant. And I just wanted to show you um, how good can FNIRS work. I'm not saying that it always works like this, but it can work like this. So you see the, the strong coherence of oxy and deoxygenated hemoglobin, and also a strong um, coherence with, with the fMRI data here. Um, one thing, uh, one of my PhD students also recently um, created FNIRS probability maps. So kind of, um, Oh, these are actually fMRI probability maps, I have to say. And these are not FNIS probability maps, I have to correct this. Um, so this we can also use, uh, of course, for maybe um, the choice for, for, for optode um, pair that we pick for the channel of interest and so on. So now um, the results. Uh, when we look at, uh, at this two choice to the eye, um, you see that we can either use HBO, HBR, or a, co a combination of this. So you increase the amount of features for encoding this. So it's a multivariate analysis, what was done. Um, did I write it here? No, but um, it was a multivariate analysis. And you see these are the results. And um, when you say the two task classification results was best for when you combine all information you have just by putting together the HBO and HBR result uh, data. So there are also good results already by just using one chromophore, but the combination brought the best results. And you see this is also true for almost all subjects. No? so that you had a little benefit um, of, of combining it. I mean, the individual accuracy for the ATAS decoding accuracy, I mean, the chance level is 12.5%, um, varied between 30 to 60%. So you see here the huge differences. And you also see that different um, task pairs, like here MTSN is mental talking and spatial navigation, it differs. But generally, all task pairs were uh, quite, um, nicely to differentiate. So 70% actually this year is the border that is considered as a border that has to be reached um, to have useful two choice uh, communication. So that is actually really nice. And um, that also means maybe that we can um, let people decide themselves what task to use for a BCI, what task they like to perform. Okay, um, there is room for individualization, of course. Um, but um, what a drawback is, of course, with this kind of um, applications, you need a huge uh, FNS montage. Um, and 
time and yeah. So I would like now to go to a very recent study that we published recently, um, and it's kind of um, using um, one single channel to to look at for for asking a yes or a no response. And what we wanted to do by that, especially, was to increase BCI efficiency by decreasing the information encoding time. So the so the, the first information encoding time, so the, the, the study that I showed with the coma patient, for example, or the vegetative state patient, was 30 seconds and then five repetitions. Only by then you could um, decide whether it was a yes or no answer. What we did here, we really pushed it to the limit. Namely, we just used the answer of two seconds per answer. So, and by that we wanted to increase the naturalness, you know, because answers are short. But we also not only used um, a short um, encoding time, we also um, tried to make a natural um, imagery task. I'll come to that later. And we also used two complementary FNIOS montages to increase FNIOS sensitivity um, to overcome this problem with the blind spots. Okay, so what, how, how did we do the encoding and how did we link it to meaning? So for example, for an encoding of yes, subjects should draw a check mark at the same time saying, yes, that's true. So we combined actually two tasks uh, in order to increase uh, the, 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 the reaction of the brain, let's say. And for the answer no, we asked the subject to crossing out something and to say, no, that's not true. This all approximately took two seconds. And we used an, a temporal encoding paradigm, which means that there was always one answer period and we had a yes answer period and a no answer period. And depending on whether a subject answered to yes or to no with the particular strategy, we hoped to disentangle then the, the answer. Um, this is what I meant by using two complementary optode montages. Um, we used nine, nine sources and eight detectors because we also included a, a short distance channel that we created ourselves because we haven't had the short channels at that time. And, and you see nicely here that, for example, this area would be not so covered so well because it's not covered by that and not by that. And here you only partially maybe get some activity from here. So by, by switching every second rows, um, the, um, um, the optodes, you, you now in the second optode setup get really this, this area covered. This, of course, means we had to do two localizer runs. A localizer means we, we, we try to define the best channel by chromophore combination, actually. Um, we had to do this twice, but each took, I think, um, how much? I think maybe 10, uh, 10 minutes a localizer. But then you had the best chance to, to find a spot um, in the nearest cap that has highest sensitivity for the task. So, so we did this in our subjects. Uh, we, we defined the best cap. We defined the best optode um, um, chromophore by channel combination. And then we had 10 answer questions with 10 se separate trials in each of the um, runs in order to have many, many trials. Um, we also obtained easiness and pleasantness ra ratings. And um, yeah, so the analysis was done with the software that is, which is developed here in Maastricht. Is uh, called Turbosatory is the real-time analysis software. Um, it's developed by Michael Lurs, and um, it includes standard pre-processing, including short channel correction. Um, so the localizer runs were used to define the most prominent channel, channel by chromophore combination. And in the encoding runs, um, the answer decoding from the time courses was um, then done by using a GLM with the two predictors according to the, to the two different encoding periods that we have. Okay, so these are our results. Um, we have a whole run accuracy by taking 10 trials together. So it's kind of averaging also in order to increase the power. So you see the, the whole run accuracy is, is approximately 86%, which is really great. But if we look at the single trial accuracy, it's also already quite good. So we reach across all subjects and you always have good ones. And ones that, that cannot use FNIR so efficiently, but in total we have a mean of almost 70%, which is really nice. One thing that I would like to point to is also that here the dot that you see is the score that the participants obtain uh, with respect to the suitability 
we call this ethnosuitability. So we check the physical features of participants. So for example, what is the hair thickness, the hair color, and so on. And then there's a score. And the, the lower the score is, the better is the suitability for um, ethnias as we see it. It's not a standardized instrument, but can be really useful. And you see here a high correlation of this um, with the obtained single trial accuracy. Of course, not true for all subject, but that's what it is, because we also have other factors here. We have motivational factors here and so on. But I think it is really nicely to see that the higher the score, um, the, the higher the score here, the lower the performance. So if someone is interested um, for this, um, I would like to point to the um, publication from uh, from um, a PhD student of mine, it's not focusing on this um, question, but it's using it and, and introducing it. And it's actually Laurine, which also then um, did another study that I would shortly like to in, introduce to you. It's a study that extends this hemodynamic FNES BCI uh, approach from two choices to four choices. So four choices now, and also to not only use the um, auditory domain for information encoding help, but also the, the tactile and the auditory one. So we wanted to increase the BCI flexibility. And we also wanted to show the stability um, of FNIS performance across time, and also the feasibility of FNIS PCIs in everyday work, because so far we did everything in the lab. So what is the, the idea behind that is that we have an M temporal ethnic signal feature um, use, let's say, for option A, you encode, um, yeah, you would perform the task when you hear or see the instruction for encoding A. For B, you would start when A has ended and until B um, is instructed to stop and so on, and you would see a kind of shift in the hemodynamic response, depending on the answer option that was given. So how did we do this? In the auditor domain, we just use WAV files for indicating. Now, so for example, for encoding B, a subject has to start performing the task when it hears B and stops when it hears C. Um, and for tactile, we used the four fingers to indicate it. It's, it's quite logical. We also did five repetitions per run because we were not sure how sensitive we would B. So therefore, we also have um, multi-trial and single-trial accuracies. And for the instruction, uh, we, we really go for clear instruction. We don't leave so much room for the subject for now because we have learned that when, when we tell a subject really what to do, they feel much more comfortable, they do it, and it works um, mostly. So and what we asked here is mental drawing, which means please imagine drawing simple geometrical figures or small contour drawings and do this in a constant speed. Try to imagine using a pen and so on. So we really give them help so that they know what to imagine. And people normally say that's quite easy. So here we had no optode um, switching. We just used the standard checkerboard setup and no short channels at that time. And we had an experimental design um, correcting for any kind of order effects and motivation effects and so on for the different modalities. So the localizer ones were also used um, in the, the three different sensory uh, modalities so that there's no um, kind of bias to one of the modalities. And also here, the topozatory was used um, very straightforward. Uh, localizer was done as before. I would like to show you that here also the um, the most promising channels differed um, or varied across session, like for here for participant one. But we also had patients where the the, the um, channel was very uh, the channels the first three the top three channels were very stable here, and yeah this can be linked to change of strategy here and maybe subject two was very clear and always really doing the same and also in the same way, but it's it's maybe good to always check what is the best channel at the moment. Um, yeah, so then the encoding ones were just um, yeah, for predictors according to, to the four different answer periods. And then the, the option with the highest T value um, yeah, was then the winner option, so to say. And these are the results. So the single trial level is the, uh, this one here. So you see also again here, we have high single trial accuracy, much higher than the empirical chance level, which is indicated here. On the run level, we really got uh, excellent results. And two subjects were actually tested in a cafeteria. So in the real world, there's a subject five and six, and those belong to those that were the best subjects, or let's say 
for, for which we for who we achieved the best results. And uh, we also had a couple of um, FNI, uh, BSCI novices. So you, you see that it might work already at the first session. Here you see the effect of sensory input modality. So no big differences. It seems that people can use of all um, of these techniques. And um, yeah, and you also see across time, there's almost no time effect, no learning effect, but also no effect that it gets worse. So that was actually very nice. And we, we saw a little tiny effect like using the mean of the top three best channels. Um, this might be also a point to, to consider for, for further development. Okay, let me conclude. Also, so I, I hope I could show, show you that FNIUS constitutes a really promising functional neuroimaging method for interaction BCIs or for neurofeedback therapy applications and those to treat neurological and psychiatric disorders. And the most important point is it's in real world environments. Um, and it's, it's potentially suited for long-term repeated BCI training or use, even in difficult populations such as children and patients. And I really think also that these, um, let's say when it comes to neurofeedback applications in, um, at home, I am really sure um, that the caretakers, the family members, they could do it. There is no need of a doctor or a, a, an expert in this. Um, of course, more research and methodological developments are needed, especially also technical developments to make the system yeah, more suited for, for this kind of applications. But um, I just hope that this, this will, will be in the future. So many thanks for, for your attention so far. Um, I don't know whether we should now have time for question or rather at the end after the demo, because we still have about 20 minutes time and that would be perfect for the demo. Um, I would also like to thank, of course, uh, many people um, here and my, my collaborators and the grants I received in the past. Let's now switch to the FNIRS demo. For this, you, you still see my, um, it's, no, it's of course important to see my face and my head, this is, yeah. Okay, so I will, Put on the cap, and I did. I did not before and had the cap already on, because I just also wanted to say how fast it actually goes for those that are not um, familiar with FNIRS. Of course, when you do it alone, it's more difficult. But I can just highly encourage people to do it. It's a lot of fun for testing out stuff and so on. And um, yeah, it depends a little bit on the position of the optodes. I think in occipital cortex, it doesn't work so well. But now here for the motor region, for frontal regions, also parietal regions, I think it works good. And of course, I have done it many times already. So for me, it's really not so difficult. So I just check a little bit the contact. Okay, we will see anyway in the calibration whether everything went fine. So, okay, good. So I use this, this, this shower cap because this is really good for preventing um, light. Um, I need my glasses back. And I go to Aurora and do the calibration, okay. Okay, this looks good. Dark noise levels, source brightness levels, good. Let's see when we do a test recording. Yeah, signal quality is good. Even when I talk, you see, I talk and the, 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 the quality is, is still very nice. Okay. 
So what I have done yesterday, I uh, did a localizer yesterday and got these results, for example, from a motor imagery experiment. You see, this is, this is, um, this is the time course of my motor imagery trials in the primary motor area. And it can, of course, be that it's also partially from the premotor cortex or from the postcentral gyrus, whatever, because we, we work with FNIRS. We don't know where we are, but it's a, it's a sensitive um, channel here. And this channel I pick now for encoding an answer. No? So I yesterday did uh, the localizer because I felt confident to say, look, it will work also tomorrow, hopefully. So normally you do this at the same day so that you really have the same situation. So, but I, I trust, um, I make benefit of the low spatial resolution of the a little bit. Um, what do I do? I would like to encode an answer, yeah, the yes or no answer. And I would like to ask maybe um, um, Daina to, to tell me what should I encode? Should I encode a yes or a no? Uh, encode yes. Okay, I go for yes. So that would mean I put my, cur uh, my, my contrast to yes. Um, so because I expect activity versus, versus the yes phase. Um, I go to my channel, which I've selected, which is the here now, the channel two five. And what you will see in a second is that you see here the hemodynamic response. Can let me do it like this, that's a bit bigger. Yeah, so I have now here two trials with a yes and a no phase, yes and a no phase, two trials. I will encode yes. Yeah, maybe we can also say, should I encode then yes, no? Or should I encode yes, yes? Or yeah, what should I maybe do both um, options? So first a yes and then a no. Oh, but this is not possible because we have a repetition. No, no, sorry. We do two trials of yes first, okay. Um, yeah, that's all what I have to do. This is the software. Tobo Zatori, what I already shortly introduced to you. Um, it looks maybe a little bit overwhelming, but all what you have to check is here the red line for oxygenated hemoglobin. And then when this is my instruction here, when it, when the, the green line comes in this window, I will perform the task and uh, until I leave this window. So this is how I encode. And I will not do anything when the when the signal enters this red phase for the no answers. Um, and I will also leave my, my hand so that you really see that I'm not secretly below the, um, the table, do some motor stuff or so. I really try to do the motor imagery. So um, yes, I will start here now the um, turbosatory. And I will start, maybe, maybe the first one we do actually with the motor performance so that you really learn the paradigm because it might be that's quite overwhelming. So I will do now a yes encoding by motor performance. Time we have. Okay, I just start. I might even be able to talk during I do the task. I, I recently tried this and it worked very well. Um, so you see really the, in the, in the spatial specificity still of FNIRS. Okay, let's start. So I hope you see also my hand here.
I have to say it didn't work so well. I mean, you still see by ex that, that the response for, for yes is higher than for, for no. So in order to decide whether it was a yes or, in, or no, you do the contrast yes versus resting and check the, the T value, which is here 2.4 against the test um, no versus resting, which is 0 0.1. So you would decide and you go for uh, a yes. Um, I have to say that was just much, much better yesterday. Um, let me see whether I have one of the settings differently. No. Just check here. Yeah, maybe this channel is today a little bit better, which is a bit more the the a bit more posterior. Let's let's use this. Maybe we also check the deoxygenation at hemoglobin. You see here it's more clear that here it goes down for 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 an for a yes. Um, now I will encode the yes, but now based on motor imagery, maybe this works better, let's see. So the only thing I have to do is to start um, the encoding again. I will this time switch to deoxygenated hemoglobin. So we expect then for a yes, a drop in the signal. Let's see. Okay, actually this went better than the motor performance actually. I mean, maybe you see it more clear when you when I put it a little bit more narrow. See here clearly the drop of the signal, here not so much. The drop comes later after the, the, the period already. Here the drop is really um, according to the expected one in the hemodynamic response. And here, maybe I can, I can also increase it here a little bit. When I put the expected hemodynamic response function, then of course this is more, much more similar. The green line is much more similar than the, the the red line, which is for the no answer. And I can contrast yes versus no, and I see that I have a positive um, t value for this contrast in my chosen um, channel. There are even channels that are better suited. I just see, but I see this. If I would do the contrast the other way around, then I would get a negative value. So that would means yeah, that the, the subject has not performed the task during the yes periods. So actually, even if it's not so clearly visible, 
um, the, the, there were the correct answers. So here, for example, I, when I just showed the yes response, so you see the green line is the expected one. You see clearly, I mean, the smaller variations in the signals are the Maya waves that we are so familiar with. Um, so kind of the Maya waves a little bit cover, of course, um, the, the, the good hemodynamic signal. Okay, so are there any questions for now? Thank you for this absolutely fascinating talk. Um, this is extremely interesting, and I'm so I'm so happy that you gave it. Um, we have just about four minutes left, so if anybody wants to ask questions, um, pl uh, you know, please feel free to go ahead and uh, do so. Um, but also thank you to everyone who's attending today. Um, it's um, appreciated, and I'm glad to see such interest also in this community. I think we had a great turnout.